the street lights flash past orange black orange black swinging low over the windscreens over our faces it's fine it's not fine it's fine but it's not this car we're in could skid off the road and plow into a tree or oncoming traffic i see us ripping through a crash barrier causing a ten car pileup i can see us being arrested i can see us breaking our necks these thoughts are wild these thoughts are ridiculous I'm in a car with my husband, traveling on a well-marked A40 back to Oxford, and we know where she is now. She's at home. She's quite safe. There's nothing to go crazy about. There's nothing to fear. Christy's violin case slides around on the back seat, despite the fact that we're strapped, we've strapped it in. She left with her rucksack and her coat, but not her instrument. The instrument she loves so much. Another small thing that doesn't add up. Something she was trying to communicate to us. But what? Chrissy, I think. Chrissy. 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 I'm still fumbling to grasp the details of what happened. We searched all over the London concert venue for her after the fire crew gave us the all clear. A false alarm, they eventually declared. We had been standing outside for 45 minutes by then, but split up into different areas, audience on one side of the concert venue and performers and staff on the other. How we're supposed to know what Chrissy wasn't there? She, she taught things so well, making sure she'd been accounted for among the bodies gathered outside before she disappeared. And she wasn't back at the hotel either, the place where we dropped off our overnight bags earlier and the three of us took the chance to drink a half cup of tea before the show. There was a big white double bed in the room with crisp, crisp clean sheets and a deep comfy mattress. I wanted to climb right into that bed, curl up and sleep for a long time. But Chrissy was jittery. To be honest, we all were, and why wouldn't we be? In a few hours, our teenage daughter would be standing center stage in front of the TV cameras and the live audience and the judges. And then, after all that build-up, the night her performance ended with this. The seatbelt strains like a garret across my neck. I lean forward, craning to see behind, beyond the cat's eyes and white lines zipping past. Oh, my husband is in the driver's seat. He is so reliable, so safe. How much I've depended on him over the years, rightly or wrongly, ten years together, and who would believe where we are at now? The seatbelt slides up, pressing where the skin of my jaw is still sensitive, only recently returned to its natural hue. She played so well. Didn't she? Paul's hand tightened on the steering wheel, as though they were already gripping tightly enough. She did, Julia. She was truly brilliant. So why this? I want to demand of him as though he has any better answers than I do, as though he has secrets to reveal of his own. Why did she bolt from the venue when the fire alarm went off? Why do I suspect that she set it off herself? But it makes no sense that she would run off before the winners were announced, when she had every chance of becoming one of them. Why do that without telling us and without them bothering to answer her phone? but instead sending us and all the staff into such a panic, wasting everyone's time in searching the barbarican and then the hotel. And we had no idea where she was until eventually Paul turned on the tracker app, the one he had installed on her phone, and his after the time at the botanical gardens, the one I didn't know about until tonight. And lo and behold, turns out of all places she had gone back home. It seems she just got herself on a train from London, Paddington to Oxford and left. So it's fine, I, I tell myself. She's fine. Those images of disaster all of, of, are all of my own making because of my own guilt and my own lies. Black orange. We're going to talk to her, Paul says. Properly this time. We cannot have her acting like this. Yes, we will, of course. My stomach instinctively rolls at the thought of such a discussion. But when it comes down to it, I'll listen to everything she has to say. That's over now, I remind myself. That's done. In my lap, my phone blips and I fumble to swipe the message. Chrissy? But it isn't her, of course. It's one of the young musicians. Coordinators. Let us know as soon as you're with her. We're so sorry about this. Let us know absolutely anything we can do. Thank you. I will. I text back. I'm sorry. My husband's. I tell my husband, I'm sorry I haven't been there. Paul gives a nod. I chose to take it as a, I know, almost home. 
The knowledge makes me feel weak with relief. We just have to navigate Oxford one way system and we'll arrive at our grand sturdy house on Woodstock Road. For the dozenth time, I check the tracker app on Paul's phone, seeking to reassure myself yet again. The little pulsing dot hasn't moved. It's still hovering exactly over our house. I wish I could zoom so close in, uh, into our street, our home, to tell exactly which room she's in. Is it her bedroom or practice room, our bright kitchen or our sn snug? I'd like to be able to zoom in on every square foot of whichever space and sensely exact what she's doing right now, lying in bed or fixing herself a snack or throwing herself into yet more practice. In a moment, though, we'll know for sure. Paul swings the car into a wide gravel drive. I can hear her dog Jackson barking either before, uh, either, before either of us even gets out. Thank God, thank God. There's a light on upstairs in Chrissy's window with her bedroom that stretches across one whole end of our house, leaving the suitcase and her violin in the car for now. I point. Look, she's in there. She really is home. Jackson's bark continues to ricochet from the indoor hallway. I grab Paul's arm as he puts his hand on the knob of our front door. Calmly, I say, we have to go in there calmly. No panic. No shouting. We've just got to let her know how worried we've been. My head falls loose on my neck as I speak. No panic, Paul echoes. No yelling. I might want to tell that to Jackson, though. I give a weak smile, and Paul grins back, his joke letting in further ripples of relief. He puts an arm around me in a brief, forgiving hug as I turn the knob and keep the door shut. It sticks. No, it doesn't stick. The door never sticks. Jackson's spark escalate. It's locked. Have you got your keys? Silently, he fishes them from his pocket and nearly slides the right one into the lock. As the door opens. Jackson is all over us. Down. Hey, down boy. I fumble for the hallway light switch and click it on as Paul works to calm Jackson. She could at least have fed him. Why don't you go up first, I say quietly, and I'll put the kettle on. I'll come in a minute and have some tea for her. We, I follow Jackson to the kitchen and I switch the kettle on. I listen for any sound of Chrissy moving upstairs. But Paul leaves Jackson with me and heads upstairs. I try to stay calm as I put some fresh biscuits down for him. He doesn't seem very interested and instead sits on the tile floor looking at me with his big eyes. What a nightmare, I whisper. I can hear Paul's footsteps upstairs, lumbering around. The kettle's really getting going for it now and I hunt in the cupboards with a box of tea clicking my tongue because Paul's moved it again. The kettle clicks off. Julia, I jump spinning around to find Paul standing there. What is it? She isn't here. What? She has to be. Come and see for yourself if you don't believe me. I feel as though gravity's pull has doubled as I follow my husband upstairs. Jackson trotting faithfully behind. The doors to all the rooms upstairs stand open. Paul must have looked in every room. I followed him at the doorway of Chrissy's room. The light's on, but she isn't there. I grasp Paul's arm. Look, Chrissy is a neat child. She always has been. So now the scene is wrong in a hundred different ways. Her bed is a state, the duvet half dragged off, her wooden desk tipped over on its side, her phone on the floor, the screen smashed. Jackson barks again. A nightmare, a nightmare. My mind goes wild. A whole new ream of image is cascading through it. A slap, a struggle, a scream, a fall, the crash of furniture, the crack of glass, the thud of limbs. I stand in Chrissy's room, lost in disbelief and hear fear because those images are all I can see. A nightmare, a nightmare, playing over and over again.